Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Hello, all you Orties out there. Welcome back to the Forty Orty Podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley from the Asperger's Growth Channel. How are you doing today? It is, well, it was sunny and now it's very grey outside in the uh, town of North Yorkshire, if it is a town, if you could call it a town. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I think is probably one of the most talked about things, or at least the thing that people ask the most questions about, and that's improving your social skills, making friends, making relationships on the autistic spectrum. It's a very difficult thing to do, and and I can attest to this. I've not always been the social butterfly that I am now, and I took a journey for about two or three years to sort of get where I am today, writing about it, working on things learning about psychology, learning about social interaction, and here I am today. And we have another person who is also a very, very social butterfly, that doesn't make any sense. Adam, how are you doing? Doing very well, how are you? I'm all right, not too bad. Bit of a slow <laughs> day today. Um, yeah. I had to go, go get, myself, um, get myself out of bed today. It was, it was a, bit of a bit of a tough time. I wasn't budging. Coffee, coffee usually solves that solution, uh, that that problem for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that, but then it also brings up the issue of of getting downstairs as well, because that's something that's not gonna not gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> for me. It needs to be right on my desk, mm. ready to ready to be drunk in the morning. But then, of course, it'll be cold by then, so it's a bit tough. You need a thermos <laughs> and someone to make your coffee for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could do that. I could up order myself a a personal barista and then <laughs> get it sent to me mm. by the postman. <laughs> I'm off the clock at the moment. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. Well, <laughs> follow it. Following with that, would you like to give everybody a little introduction into who you are and what you do? Sure. So uh, my name is Adam Mohammed. I'm 22 years old. Birthday next week. And uh, I graduated the University of Manchester the same year as Tom. And since graduating last year, I have essentially been a man of two careers. So on one side of things, I am a cocktail and champagne bartender. And with the territory of serving um, people their champagne lunches, I'm also a fully trained barista. And the other half of that, actually using the degree that I spent four years to you uh, to, to earn, uh, <laughs> I currently work for a company called EM Analytical, and I'm developing coronavirus testing kits. Very cool. That is a very good introduction. <laughs> As you can oh. probably tell everyone out there, Adam is a very well-worked man. He's, um, I think, in uh, just after uni, you got that bartending job, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, Straight so- into it. I think I, so with the past two jobs that I've had being champagne bartending and coronavirus testing kit maker, um, both of those jobs had the exact same introduction with the, the bar that I worked for was, I, I was hired on the opening, which was a very chaotic mm. environment because no one had worked at that bar before because it was originally open. And same thing with coronavirus. Um, no one expected to need to make hundreds of thousands of testing kits. So both of those environments led themselves to a very hectic environment. But mm. yeah, the, the bar job yeah. was July. Well, um, I think basically I, th- I thought that you would be the best person to, um, to talk about social skills and stuff. Because we think throughout the university experience, or at least... For the last year of university, we were quite the um, um, the party team, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, you, me, and Jack uh, 
we, we tore up fourth year. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, barely a weekend went by without us going out somewhere on some crazy adventure. Indeed. And um, I think you and Jack were sort of more... When, when did you meet Jack? Was it sort of the first, second year or something? Jack and I met in first year because we both did biochemistry and we kind of spotted each other around lectures. Um, but then we properly became friends, I'd say, about the beginning of second year. Mm-hmm. And then he went and he, he went and did a year abroad in Sweden during third year, kept in very good contact. Um, myself and a few friends actually went to Sweden that year to go visit him. And then we became housemates in fourth year. Yeah, well, it was it was a very interesting time at university. It's it's. I've never experienced um, that sort of group mentality. I've always been sort of the quiet, I wouldn't say lone wolf because that sounds a little bit grandiose, but (laughs) I've always been the quiet one on his own, Mm. um, sort of dipping in and out of social groups. And the group that we had with sort of Jack and and you and and some of the other housemates was probably one of of the first um, groups that I actually felt sort of involved with it wasn't really sure there'll be there have been times in my sort of secondary school and primary school where I've been a part of groups but I'd never felt um a particular affiliation with them if that made sense okay so with what you said earlier about your um social butterfly status being about two or three years old was that when you Mm. started really developing your social skills yeah well it's I'd never really paid much attention to it because I, I went through the entirety of um, secondary school, at least the sort of tail end of it, um, studying um, mm-hmm. and, and working at stuff and, and also doing my taekwondo. So I, I'd never really had much opportunity to leave any energy to work on my social skills. Okay. Um, it's only when I had a little bit of a dip in my in my second year where... Um, I didn't really have as as much energy to study, and that I started to sort of research it. You know, look at YouTube videos on improving your charisma and and all that kind of stuff, and basically just taking apart conversations that I've had or thoughts that I've had about how I may be perceiving things differently, okay. and trying to use that to improve my social skills. It was a quite a um, a long and <laughs> a long and, and a, very much a trial and error process. Yeah, definitely. Because uh, I think for me, it was a very similar journey, but maybe shifted back. Because I think when I first started to take an upturn in my social life was, I think, last year of sixth form. So I might have only been like a year off from you. Mm-hmm. So you started at the tail end of sixth form. That's when you started to get involved with social groups yeah year 13 was uh so it was the year that i had my first girlfriend i turned 18 um started actually going to house parties uh because everyone else was turning 18 i never had that um you know um for 15th birthday party where you know you try and sneak one of your dad's beers and pretend to be a baller um so i think i only started partying when i was allowed to drink (laughs) Yes, I think that that's something that we share with mm. that. It was, I was very much in tune with, with sort of what I should and shouldn't do. And, and I thought, you know, I'm going to wait until I'm 18 to mm. get involved in something because that seems to be the smartest way to go. Yeah. Uh, but I was never, never a sort of went to proper parties before sort of the mm. 18 came around. I went to a few sort of garden parties, which... We're a bit sort of light and, you know, more of kind of a, a chat um, mm. than a party party. But my 18th, I had a party party and a sort of hide out a venue and stuff. And Oh, nice. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it was a very sort of scattered party because there was a lot of <laughs> sort of people from different groups that I was friends with. And then they sort of brought a few of their friends and then, you know, it's, there's sort of like little bubbles around the venue that people were gathering in. Mm-hmm. Navigating the social circles. That's uh, that's one of the things that we learned from partying in fourth year is how to yes. move between groups. Mm. Yeah, it's a difficult one. <laughs> 
especially if you don't have a lot of experience. And I think just sort of making your way into any sort of social s- circle is, is quite difficult. Um, mm. I think, I think, shall we talk a little bit about the documentary before we get into sort of um, your experiences with autism and stuff? Yeah, of course. So yeah, just, just for any listeners out there, we, we did meet at, in our time at university. Uh, we both did a life sciences like degree. So I did biomedical sciences and, and uh, what did you do, Adam? It was biochemistry. Bio, biochemistry, of course. And uh, yeah, Ad- Adam and Jack were basically two two of my closest friends in fourth year. We sort we, we did a lot of things in the day and then and the night and all that kind of stuff. At uh, one night, I think one particular night, I think we were doing some board game house party or, or something like that, and. Ah, uh, yes, uh, the Game of Thrones Risk Evenings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah you, t- you took me to a side and you, you, you told me about you being autistic and stuff. And I think th- there was sort of a funny revelation that I had because I was, I always, I thought that there was something a little bit different about you, but I wasn't fully able to put my finger on it. Jack actually made the exact same assessment. Yes. Yeah. So. I think um, it was it was quite nice for me to hear it coming from um, someone who's obviously worked on their social skills as well, because most of the people that I meet that are autistic aren't necessarily the um, the most social people, or at least they don't sort of get involved in the sort of party aspects of university. Yeah, I believe the the exact nature of the um, of the evening. So I think it was uh, you, me, and Jack, and then Phoebe, Helena, and Katie. Um, yes. we're, we're all playing the board game and I think cause at the time you, you had also, you, you'd started becoming, uh, outspoken about the fact that you're autistic. Like I'm fairly certain you were, you started to begin raising awareness, um, and actually making that an active part of your life. And then I remember seeing that and thinking, oh, well, you know, this is a guy who's clearly quite conf- uh, like confident and open about these kinds of things. So I think one, that was just the evening where I decided, yeah, screw it, I'll tell him. Mm. Cause I think I'd become so used to being an autistic that no one noticed. The idea of telling someone was almost a spontaneous decision because it's an aspect of myself that I'd almost let myself ignore. Yes. I think maybe it was like a month or two after um, I, I decided to sort of um, submit my, proposal for the for the documentary to the to the university mm-hmm. and I got in contact with a few people from around uni um a few support staff someone from um who shot the B- the BBC Man- BBC Radio Manchester video mm-hmm. and I asked you whether you would like to be a part of it and you said yes of course and I I thought that because obviously there is a lot of contrasting personalities and opinions in the autistic community and, and in any community, mm-hmm. I think your sort of your views and your mentality and experiences were very, very well in contrast with some of the other experiences that people were talking about. Mm. I thought I thought you made quite I thought you made quite a um, a statement in it. <laughs> One thing that I was uh, picking up on with the flow of the documentary is. Um... Most of the other guests were talking about overcoming the struggles, the trials, the tribulations of being autistic, things like struggling with school. And then I remember just watching myself on television, essentially, because we have YouTube on the television, um, just mm. laid back being like, oh, yeah, being autistic's great. <laughs> yeah. And I think I'm very much sort of in the middle. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Like, I'm not overly keen about making autism a uh, sort of like a superpower in the public <laughs> eye. Yeah. But I also have a lot of experiences with the, the sort of negative aspects of being autistic. Mm. But I, I, thought, I thought that sort of your inclusion into the documentary made it more realistic, I guess. Didn't, you, you didn't just like say all of the things that you, th- you think you should have said. It's, mm. it's more like your, your opinion, and that was, I think, what was so sort of catching by your interviews. Yeah. But what was the, the filming process like you? Like, have you ever talked about being autistic in public? 
Um, I believe talking with you and Jack uh, at my house was the first time that I'd spoken about being autistic publicly in at least a few years. I think one of the times that I remember telling anyone else was, I believe, when I was in year 12, so lower lower sixth form. Mm-hmm. So essentially, my, my experience with help with being autistic, not to jump the question format or anything, but um, so the way that autism was handled at my secondary school, the help was available, but no one ever came to you. You had to go and seek the help. So if you wanted help, it was available, but if you didn't want help, you didn't have to have someone pulling you out of lessons. And yes. from that, I knew how many autistics there were in my school because when we started secondary school, They put us all in a room and were like, hi, these are the services available to you. Take them or leave them. Mm -hmm. And so one of my friends was talking about his mum who worked with autistics. And uh, my friend in sixth form was like, oh, I've never actually met an autistic. And I said to him, well, I'm one. (laughs) (laughs) And what was his response? His response was, oh, really? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> um, and, and that was probably a, a learning curve for him to realize that autistics can just go under the radar like that. Yeah. Another time that I spoke about it was, so I was diagnosed at the age of three years old, but my yes, parents- was incredibly young. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was one of the lucky ones that was caught early in. Um, I told you in the documentary that they actually thought that I had a hearing issue. Yes. Yeah, that's very common, I think. Mm. So I was diagnosed at three, but obviously um, my mind wasn't fully formed at the time. So my parents actually sat me down at the age of 10 and explained to me that I was autistic. Mm -hmm. So those are the three times in my life where I can specifically remember talking about being autistic. Well, I guess now would be the fourth time. Yes. (laughs) And um, And the documentary. I think as of... Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Five times total. (laughs) You have indeed, and it's going to be going out on a, on the podcast, and it's going to be. Well, I think the documentary has got about, I think about four thousand views last time that I checked it, mm-hmm. which is amazing, which is awesome. Um, it's way it's blowing out the water pretty much every other one of my videos that I put up on YouTube. Yeah, and yeah, like like how do you feel about that? How do you feel about? the possibility of it being sort of a mainstream thing. And um, I think I'm fairly comfortable with the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's something that I've almost hidden for a long time because I made the, deve- the necessary developments in my social skills. And then once I was comfortable with the, l- my social abilities, I almost just wrote it off as like, Oh, right. Don't have to think about that ever again. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I like that it's come up again because I, I don't want to pretend to be a hero, but I would uh, quite like the idea of any of the 4,000 people that watch the documentary gaining something out of my input. Yes. I think that's that's something that every single interviewee shared. I think it's something that is important. It's important to give people an idea Mm. of what Asperger's is, or ASD1, if you you want to call that now. Mm. And also, I think we have a very large shortage of sort of role models and stuff for yeah. autistic people. A lot of the sort of stuff that's put out by any sort of media head um, is is generally about sort of the more um, low functioning side of the spectrum. So people who have a lot of impairments that make it so that they need sort of 24 hour support or a heavy amount of support and they don't really see they don't really see the other side to it, I guess. Mm. The more the more high functioning side. That was actually uh, my first ever introduction to autism. Was at the age of five. Uh, one of my friends in school, one of their cousins was um, severely autistic and needed twenty four hour care. Mm-hmm. And then I think part of why I repressed telling anyone that I was autistic was because of that association. Um, I didn't want anyone thinking that I needed 24-hour care. Yeah. Um, Which, you know, it's a bad thought because there's nothing wrong with that. It was a preconceived notion that I had where I didn't want to be part of the group. Yeah. You didn't want to sort of be associated in that way. Yeah. I I was very much trying to avoid judgment. Mm -hmm. 
by having it be something that was well known. But I think the reason that I'm comfortable talking about it now is because I've essentially finished, well, no one's ever finished learning, but, <laughs> but I've completed the majority of my social and um, academic training. So as a now a fully formed adult that can hold relationships, make friends in any circumstance and have two careers, um, I'm now confident in people knowing that I'm autistic because they know that I can do all those other things. Yeah. There is a lot of times sort of a preconceived notion that autistic people should be a certain way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the typical sort of signs of autism, a lot of, I mean, in, in the triad of impairments, two of those are linked to sort of being able to communicate and make friends and, and form communic- communicative relationships. Mm. So I think that sort of overarching idea of what autism is makes people like myself and you quite a spectacle for people yeah (laughs) (laughs) i guess like i think (laughs) i think it's it's always something that people are shocked about yeah if if i if i tell people that i am and i do i do do it a lot but only if it comes up in in conversation Mm -hmm. like i'm not gonna just throw it in there it's it's gotta come up in conversation when it does there's never been a time where it's put someone off talking to me, which I'm quite pleased about. That's very reassuring. It is. It is. But I think it's all its all the way that you do it. Yeah. Like, if you have those social skills to be able to communicate what you mean and the subtle nuances, that it, then it's easier for people to develop a sort of a connection with you on the instant and see your telling them that they're that you're autistic mm. as more of a interest rather than a statement that they should treat you this way or, or, or do any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think part of the reason why I never told anyone was because I never told anyone in the first place. So I didn't know what reaction to expect. And because I didn't know what reaction to expect, I never told anyone. So breaking that cycle was part of what ended me up on this podcast. Indeed. <laughs> breaking out of it. Yeah. And I am very happy to have you on today. So yeah, we we are talking about building social skills today. Yes. And it is something that a lot of people struggle with and of course we we have a lot of sort of commonalities in the in the social arena. But what was the process of working on your sco- social skills like for you? Would you say that it was a lot of work independently or did you get a lot of help with it? Um, I would say that um, most autistics tend to tend towards doing things themselves. The majority of the time, um, well, I'd say let's explain it like this. Um, I would separate it into three phases: primary school, secondary school, and university. Primary school, I um, I went to primary school with the teachers knowing that I was autistic um, because my diagnosis was that early. So I was put in a weekly group where we did social activities. This was things like spin a plate and then whoever picks it up first says something about themselves. Yeah. Things like that. Gr- group activities, which I'm not going to lie, I absolutely hated. Uh, <laughs> spent my <laughs> Sounds in- awful. <laughs> spent my entire time in primary school complaining about it to my mum. Yeah. Um, and... Here's the thing, because this was between the ages of three and ten. So my parents hadn't told me I was autistic, and I was going to these weekly sessions dealing with kids that I didn't like in different years to me, and all I wanted to do was get out there and play with my train set. Um, (laughs) So I spent that span of time hating all the help that I was getting. Um, But to be honest, looking back on it, there was a lot that was helpful one of the techniques that I remember, and many autistics have been given this, is you get given a sheet of paper with cartoon faces on it. And you have Social to stories. Yeah. And you have to write down the emotion that you think each face represents. And then you hand it back, you get told which one's right and wrong, and then you learn that way. Mm-hmm. So learning nonverbal communication was one of my really, really big uh, aspects. Um, then secondary school as I mentioned earlier, I was introduced to secondary school, got plonked in a room with all the other autistics, and was told, here's the help, take it or leave it. And I took none of the help. I actively avoided going anywhere near that building. 
partly to repress uh, anyone knowing that I was autistic, uh, partly to actually get out on my own and start developing social skills in the field, as it were. And then Mm -hmm. secondary school being a seven-year process, uh, I, I made a group of friends. One of them was from my primary school. We moved to the same secondary school. Um, and I, I built myself a nice little network of friends and then finally started going out, partying in sixth form. And then university was a complete reshift because university is three or four years and everyone does something different throughout uh, each year, uh, as you all know from doing a year abroad. Yes. So I did an integrated master's where I spent all four years in Manchester. So I actually benefited from staying in Manchester for the all for all four years because some people did three years then graduated some people did uh, two years a year in industry then came back in fourth year uh, some people staggered their degrees and took some time off so I think part of what helped me in that area was that I stayed in the same place for four years so I could essentially watch people come and go whilst yeah. my life didn't necessarily change all that much so creating an environment of stability and then operating outwards was what helped me at university. That's brilliant. Well, let's, um, in terms of primary school for me, mm-hmm. I didn't know that I was autistic until I was about 10 years old. Is that when you had the diagnosis? Yeah, it was actually. Okay. I was told, told then as well. So <laughs> we were both told at the age of 10, but... <laughs> um, Prior to that, I wasn't given any support for it because obviously it wasn't something that wasn't something that they knew about, so they couldn't really give me any sort of social training or, or treatment or or whatever like that. Mm-hmm. I never really went to any sort of formal things that would to help me with my social skills. Okay, it was all as you said, you know, sort of getting into secondary school, a place that you can go to. You know, like we, we had this thing called the bridge. Um, which basically is is a place for people to to go to, like who have special needs and and anything like that. But it's also a place that very emotional and difficult people go to as well. Yeah, and that was basically for me just a, a safe haven. So I, I had this little corner, you know, with I think three or four comfy chairs that I could just sit in and mm. you know pull a coat over my head just to chill out if I was was finding my uh, time at school a little bit hard okay but not none of the none of the actual sort of help or um support really came in on the autism side of things it was more sort of mental health at that age for me okay but yeah I was I was definitely put out in the world like my my mum made a lot of efforts to get me outdoors and and to different social groups, you know, like the typical cubs and beavers and all of that, you know, (laughs) um, scouts. (laughs) Did all of that kind of stuff, did a lot of sports, went to different clubs and and all that kind of stuff. I was a very sociable child, but I was never given that sort of social instruction. Okay. And the only place that I was given it was when I asked my parents about it, when I asked my mum about it. Um, that's when I start. I made adjustments to how I communicated, but it wasn't to the degree, of, you know, like someone hands you a sheet of paper and asks you to discern what emotion this person is feeling. It was never sort of formal training, if that makes sense. All oh, right, yeah, because I, I was essentially given pieces of paper to learn how to uh, socially communicate, which honestly was probably the best method for me at the time. Um, so, would you say that you and I have almost had opposite? like experiences because I had all the help available to me and hated taking it. Whereas you uh, didn't, uh, didn't have as much support. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think, yeah, I, I think you could say that. Mm. I don't know if I, if, if I was in sort of your situation that I would want it as well. Mm. Like I, I, it's difficult because I think because we are so, um, tend to be so strong minded and opinionated it can be mm. difficult for people to um to feel respected by people and we need i found that i need to feel some level of respect from the person who's helping me yeah in order for me to take it on or else it's just like some asshole that's preaching at you that's what it felt <laughs> like 
Yeah. In the mental health side of things, it did. So I can imagine that it would be something similar. But we did both get that both get told at 10 years old. Mm. So it's at least we have we have that commonality. The difference being uh, I was just catching up with everyone else's information whereas in yours it was everyone finding out at the same time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there, there were always parts of me that were very autistic when I was a kid, you know, in terms of sort of spinning around in a spot and all that. Um, I love doing that. <laughs> in terms of the actual point at which I started to work on my social skills, it was it was very much me sort of sat in my bedroom watching videos on sort of charisma and body language and facial expressions and writing about it and trying to make sort of make sure that I action those in the world and see what happens, sort of like a trial and error process. And when something went wrong or I felt a bit uneasy about a situation, then I would go back to the drawing board. Okay. Write about the experience and try and sort of dissect what went wrong. It was a very labor-intensive process. Yeah. It was, I think I, after about, a year of doing that, I think I was at the point where I had enough confidence to go out and make friendships. But yeah. and that was sort of during during Thailand, and that 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 environment in Thailand was very um, social heavy. You know, we were living in the same house. We were the the only British red- residents for miles. Um, so it was it was an in- interesting. It was quite intense at points because I was so used to sort of being on my own but after a while I sort I felt a lot more comfortable I think I'd learnt a lot more about myself after you know being in that social arena Mm. obviously there are things that I had to iron out and I still think that I've got some things to work on but in general as you've said um, I feel like I can develop relationships and, and friendships to a good enough degree now that I that I it wouldn't be much of a problem for me. Yeah. Would you say that in your uh, progression, which was the more important factor? Was it learning about other people or learning about yourself? I think that they're both important. Mm. I think the crossover between myself and other people was where the 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 useful stuff came it was it was more of like okay right let me look at my my perspective these are the things that could be wrong these are the things that could be right and i want to keep in myself and then analyze people's reactions and say you know sort of make sure that i've got enough data uh, to go by um so that i know that what i'm doing is is wrong or right and then sort of blending it in and and trying to find a middle ground between those those pieces yeah it's it's it is it is a very difficult thing i think nowadays i'm more into the the realm of trying to figure out what my values and important opinions are so that i can um, construct myself the way that i want to Mm. it's like i sort of built myself a new person and then jumped into it okay you're like a iron man suit (laughs) yeah a social Iron Man suit. That's what it was for me. <laughs> and <laughs> I did feel a bit awkward and a bit weird for a while, jumping into that suit. But mm. now that there's something that I said, that it's something that I heard was like, fake it till you make it. And <laughs> that's basically what I did. Mm. But I think, I think it's, all, it's always important to, because the, the real sort of masters in um, fitting in and, and, doing it naturally um or at least convincingly are girls like girls are a lot a lot better to um copy facial expressions and and things like that so it's it's a bit weird because from from a guy's perspective it's usually it's generally we're quite quiet quite sort of confident and direct and very mission orientated yeah (laughs) whereas with girls it's like it's more of they go through secondary school and, and and the school system and at work feeling sort of not not themselves, sort of constructing this personality that isn't themselves. Yeah. 
and that can be quite uncomfortable for them. So there there are some like differences between the genders that I've, I've found. Mm. One thing, particularly with a uh, university, the first thing that I learnt with regards to because with Freshers Week, um, wh- what would you say was your experience with Freshers Week? Because for me. I didn't like the idea of going out every single night and running around with people that I didn't know, not having a conversation with anyone because you always always went to clubs. And ladies were actually the best people to learn from because, A, they dance way better than guys, and, B, they always um, move in groups. Um, they always make sure mm. someone's got a lift home. Yeah. Stuff like that. Like, So how would you find – was your freshers' week experience with with women being the the senseis? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, most of the um, my friends up until that point, or at least most of my good friends, were female. Mm. Um, so I, I definitely found myself um, going to the, like the clubs and stuff with other females. Like it was just it wasn't like a, a thing where I w- I wanted to you know go out on the on the game or, or anything like that. It was just I wanted to go out and dance and I felt most comfortable around girls, I think. Because I, I do get what you mean. They are, they do tend to be much more group orientated, whereas with guys, they can just disappear. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, a guy will happily get himself home from a club and he'll also happily jump headfirst into a group of women. Like, <laughs> it's... Yes. <laughs> and that was one thing that definitely turned me off, the idea of being one of those guys that goes clubbing like that. Yeah. Is it just... It just seemed a tad mindless. Mm. But it just... I don't know. It just... Uh, it, it never got me as something that I wanted to do. Mm. Um, I wasn't big into the, the sort of, you know, make a show kind of thing. And then, like, it was more... I, I want to go out and have a good experience with people that I like and hopefully build connections with them. That was my sort of mentality during those times. Yeah. So but then that, obviously, sorry, sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's probably like the, the way, like we spent the majority of fourth year being uh, social butterflies in a very new group, but the way we were partying, it wasn't clubs. Usually it was music events. It was, house parties it was yes. environments where you can actually talk to people mm-hmm. yeah and I've, i found that to be more enjoyable i don't like that sort of awkwardness where you want to talk to somebody and sort of get to know them but you can't because you, you the music's too loud and mm. there's too many people around and you know it's it's a difficult one isn't it that's that's what actually confuses me about clubbing and whenever people go to clubs to pull. And it's like, well, how do you do that? Like, you, you can barely get a word in. And whenever it comes to whenever I do go to a club, um, I'll go in, I'll dance, and then I'll usually spend a fair bit of time either in the smoking area or the bar so that I can get, you know, <laughs> some personal yeah, space right. and some some breathing area. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel the same. I think that there was there was a key moment where we went to this sort of house party and we weren't expecting it to be so absolutely packed mm. and crazy. So I, th- I think I went up to you and said, Adam, are you all right? Because I want to go stand in the kitchen. You were like, yep, let's go to the <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> that sounds like something we would do, right? <laughs> yeah. I think I think we 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 both wanted a little bit of break from all the shoulder barging and pushing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, sh- sh- that's one of the things that really turns me off about clubs is even if you are in a nice circle with people that you like and you've got and there's a song that you enjoy, there's always either some drunk guy barging past you because he's busting to go to the toilet, or a bouncer hovering, or someone trying to sell you a shot for a fiver. <laughs> It's um, it's not a very. I, I didn't find a lot of utility in in going out. I think it's just. I like to go places where I like the music, but I'd only go there to dance and have and have the music. Mm. Like it was, it's not really a sort of. I, I wouldn't go there with people that I wanted to get to know better. Yeah, it would, it would be with people that I already knew very well. Mm. In order for me to sort of feel comfortable with going out to 
it because it's a different social environment, isn't it? Yeah. The rules that apply in sort of like the party atmosphere are completely different to sort of a one-on-one conversation or mm. free people or, you know, g- going up to, you know, you know, people chilling on like the grass or something like it's very different. And I think a lot of autistic people find social situations quite sort of terrifying, mm. especially if they haven't been in those situations before. Cause there isn't sort of a standard social rule for every situation. Mm. And that's what's difficult to sort of work out. I think a lot of the, the, the sort of the growing aspects for me were getting good in a certain social environment, like a sports club, transferring it to a different one, like a, like a house party or mm. a chat over a coffee. Like there's uh, the whole <laughs> social arena is completely different in that respect. Mm. And we do have a big problem with isolation and loneliness in the autistic community. It's something that I've seen a lot on my YouTube channel. A lot of people messaging and, and telling me that they they just really don't know where to start. Mm. So what do you recommend to those people? Like, what what do you think they should start doing to improving their social skills? Um, for a start, so this is advice that I would give to autistic people and or non, non-autistic people is when you're making friends on the small scale, it should be based on something you enjoy. Um, Mm. As you said, with like hanging out with someone one-on-one, over a coffee, uh, in a park in the sun, you only enjoy those kinds of things when it's with a person that you really, really like. And most people tend to have, most people with that kind of relationship tend to have common interests, such as, uh, you and me, we would happily talk for hours and hours. I mean, that's the whole point of this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but you and I have plenty of common interests, um, such as mental health, such as science, um, such as music, uh, martial arts. And I'd say my advice for an autistic person that's looking to branch out and develop their social skills is um, firstly, figure out what you're interested in. If you're interested in music, art, um, books, film, whatever it is, um, and then find an environment where you can meet a person that shares one of those interests, and then I'd say work at it friendship by friendship. And then a few years down the line, you'll be at house parties, be in the life of of the environment. Mm. I think that that's always a good place to start, somewhere Mm. that where the – the topic of, of conversation is common. Mm. So I found that sports clubs and stuff are the best for me because it gives me a chance to, you know, you've, you've got sort of a set sheet of things that you can ask, you know. Mm. It's it's a lot less um, sort of out in the open. It's yeah. not like you're walking up to someone and just saying hi and trying to start a conversation. It's mm. they're there to do something that they're interested in and you also find that interesting. Yeah, so say... Hypothetically, you were at a, a Taekwondo training session and mm-hmm. an autistic person, say, was in their first few sessions. Um, it's a lot smoother of a way to initiate a conversation, to say, uh, teach them how to hold their form correctly or how to pivot their hips when throwing a kick or something like that. It's a lot more natural to start a conversation that way than, say, going in into an environment that you don't know with people that you don't know with no common interest. Because that is mm. when the task of meeting new people and improving social skills seems like such a daunting task, especially when you're at the beginning of your progression. Yeah. I think one, one thing that is quite important that I suppose one thing that I, I struggled with is graded intimacy. So like, okay. I found that the the best way to sort of get in, get into a place where you can make friends is by sort of making those those initial sort of boring, um, you know, quick questions around who they are and and what they do and stuff like that. But also just throwing comments out there, just making sure that people know that you're you're there, uh, rather yes. than just going full front and saying. Hey, do you want to be friends? Do you want to come to this and this and this and this? <laughs> yeah, I think you've got to you've got to always err on the side of 
placing relaxation mm. at, at the, the most important thing and failing um, being able to talk to people, just focus on what you're there to do. And if an opportunity arises that you can have a little bit of a conversation with someone, then take that opportunity and then leave it a little bit and then take it again and, and chat to people and you can get to know people. And then, as you said, at some point you'll get invitations to do stuff. And mm. I think that and just learning to chill out and relax and not putting too many expectations on yourself for the yeah. first instant mm. is important. I think one of the, yourself. Yeah, I think one of the things that would help with that is uh, what you said earlier about um, learning who you are and understanding yourself. Because one thing that takes the pressure off of making friends is being completely happy with yourself. Because um, mm. one thing that uh, plenty of autistics have is enjoying time by themselves. Um, I think many of us would happily kill a whole day doing just one task. Uh, I think the last weekend I had is just spent the whole day in the sun reading a book. Mm -hmm. So I think being happy with yourself and knowing who you are is uh, a good grounding point to not be let down if someone doesn't reciprocate your friendship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think definitely there is um, a lot of feelings of, of let down and, re and rejection, I guess, mm. with autistic people first first trying to make attempts to make friends and and all of that i think yeah d definitely erring on the side of taking it slow mm. and you know if if you have a bad bad conversation with someone and you don't really feel like they, they get you or, or anything then go to go talk to someone else or mm. go put yourself in a space where there are other people um other than that person and see if you you, you have any connection with those mm. right i think also i think as a good starting point if you really if they're really struggling is to try and find some groups that are made and run by autistic people right mm. have, that is a good commonality between people it's it's easy to talk about yeah experiences with autism because it's obviously so ingrained in you and it's it's something that not everybody has and it's it's a very minority of people so having some other people to support you in your journey of improving your social skills is is quite important i think okay cuz i have never been to any autistic uh to gatherings um mm -hmm. as an adult have you encountered that and felt that it was really beneficial for you i've never really gone to any of these those groups it's always been uh, taekwondo classes that that really sort of introduced me to socializing with people okay but i think that if if i did have that um opportunity to have a, a community of people around me that were autistic or at least you know like a small group mm. it would help a lot with the, those times where you, you just feel a little bit like an alien and you're not really sure what to do and feel sad and a bit lonely like I think now that I have sort of networked on social media sites and got in contact with other autistic people, it makes it makes things a little bit easier because I've always got someone to go to who understands me completely, or at okay. least understands me to a large degree. And I think I would have liked that if you know if there was one at university at the time. Yeah, yeah, because going to a support group um, that's that's one of those things that would have never naturally occurred to me. Being a headstrong individual, I always had the idea of um, figuring it out myself, but I'm glad that you mentioned that because I would have happily just forgotten to mention that support groups exist. I think it's it's never a bad shout to go along to them. You have to mm. realize that there will be people there who also don't have like very good social skills. So you have to be, you have, you have to think, think of it in a, Test it, test in the waters kind of thing. It's just like any other social arena. It's just that you've got something that you can really talk about. And obviously within support groups, you have chance to introduce yourself. Mm. And I think those that sort of structure to it can be quite helpful. Reading reading about social skills and, and, and sort of re researching it have been quite beneficial for me, and especially writing about my experiences with myself and people. And I guess... 
there, there is to some extent a, a line where I've learned as much as I feel like I need to move on to the next stage. Mm. And then I sort of have to action it in the world and sort of test the waters, I guess. Mm. Which I suppose is a little bit different to, to your approach where you, you've sort of had that um, support when you were a little bit younger and then your way of um, improving your social skills was sort of going out there mm. and just putting yourself in it. And uh, both, both of them have a lot of holding. I think both of them are very, both of those ways of going about improving your social skills are important and they can always work for people, but everyone's an individual, you know? Like, oh, yeah. Everyone's, everyone will figure out their own way of developing their social skills. Mm-hmm. You just have uh, to work on it and believe that it will happen. Mm. So uh, one thing that really helped me solidify my social skills as an adult, um, I would by no means recommend this as advice, but um, being a bartender is, has been one of the things that has really solidified my social skills. Mm-hmm. Because with... Uh, bars, you have people come up, order a drink, it's a very short interaction, and you'll cycle through several, several people. And you know, there are plenty of bartenders that have like their their joke that they use whenever a new customer comes up to the bar. Um mm-hmm. so obviously being a bartender is a job that is very socially demanding. So I would not recommend this for anyone that isn't already most of the way there to their social progression. But even if you're a, like, say you're in a bar, watching how other people act in bars is very educational. It's like um, sort of watching a nature documentary. Oh yeah, because uh, alcohol being a substance that reduces inhibition, you get to see how people will act under uh, true freedom. Yes, yeah. So it, it's easier. I, I actually enjoy talking to drunk people. I think they're a lot easier <laughs> to talk to. Do you, do do you think that's maybe part of why you and I started going to parties as we described when alcohol was something that could be brought into the mix legally? To, to some extent, yeah. I think na- nowadays, now that I'm a bit older, I, I, I err on the so- side of caution with that. I try to go to places and not drink mm. because it's it's good to have the experience of interacting in, in sort of a normal setting. I think parties are sort of the... A natural progression to things i know i think if people feel comfortable um, with the environment or the people around you just having having one of those two stable sources is quite an important thing mm. going to going to a house that you know or having a house party yourself may, maybe don't do that um, <laughs> 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 even even just if i'm going out somewhere like a like a pub or something it's if i don't know the pub it's nice to know someone that's going with me and vice yeah. versa if i know the pub i'll be more likely to feel more comfortable with talking to new people mm. i think i think you might have mentioned that a little bit back like you said that finding that source of stability is quite important to um to work from work out from it yeah something familiar to keep you grounded Mm. I think that's that's a very important point. It's definitely something that can help you if you do find a lot find yourself with a lot of social anxiety or general anxiety. It's it can be quite a difficult thing. New stuff, I suppose, new new situations. But yeah. you need to be exposed to it in order to, for you to learn. So what parts of social skills do you think will never improve? Like what can't you work on and what can you work on? Uh, what can't I work on? <laughs> um, my natural inclination is just to respond with I can work on anything. But um, I would say one of the areas that I have tried to work on but haven't really made lots and lots of progress with is uh, I'm a little bit stubborn and I'm a little bit impulsive, mm. which basically means – I'll, I'm the kind of person that will wake up one day and go, I'm going to spend four hours making a meal and then just go do it. <laughs> like, um, because I've woken up with that idea, I'll then want to carry it through. Yes. Because why shouldn't I? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think be- being spontaneous and a little bit headstrong 
they're, they're two aspects that I tend to not work on because to an extent they've actually benefited me in some areas of life Mm -hmm. with being a bit stubborn. Uh, The difference between stubborn and determined is essentially just the difference between the environment that you're in. Yeah. Um, If you're, if you've got an idea in your head and no one else agrees, you're stubborn. If you push through with it and everyone likes it, you're determined. Yeah. Um, And the spontaneous, uh, like the, the impulsive side of my mind uh, the spontaneity. Um, it's really helpful for my creative outlets, such as um, science, bartending, uh, martial arts. The impulsive nature of my mind has produced a lot more good than it has bad. Mm-hmm. But I'd say th- those are the two areas that I don't think I'll make a lot of progress on in the next five years. Yeah. In, ter- in terms of things that I don't think I can work on, I think there's... There are a few things that sort of float around in my head. It's mm-hmm. I can never naturally put myself in someone's shoes, so it's it's always got to be if the if someone tells me something that's important, um, mm-hmm. someone that's close to me, I can't always respond to that with. I can't easily deal with that situation on the spot. It's more of a thing that I have to get, go away from the situation, think about it, and then come back in. And then mm-hmm. tell them my views. So it's it's always been a reflective period. I don't think I'm ever going to r- remove that reflective period. Okay. And I guess yeah, I, I you know sort of competing in in taekwondo and stuff. And I guess I would I would say that I'm a little bit headstrong mm. in general. But you know, it always it always falls upon you to uh, analyze and and pick up on things that that just have no chance of changing or at least a very very slim chance of changing in order for you to like know what you need to do if that makes sense adjust around it Mm. yeah also like with these being fundamental aspects of our personalities to an extent they're not the kind of things that you want to change because that would be changing entirely who you are and whilst we want to progress you don't want to lose yourself and i think you, you do need to stay true to yourself whether that's an idea in your head of where you want what you want to be or what people are not considered to be sort of like your natural personality. Because yeah. mm. I, I think, I think the, the thing that I struggle the most with, I think that's, that's never going to change is that, that period of time where you don't spend a lot of time socializing, like, and then coming back into the social arena. I think it's always a bit of a shock to the system for me. Okay. It's not something that I could just easily slip into. It's something that I have to work myself up with. You know, it's, I guess you could call it sort of exposure. You know, if you don't have enough exposure to the social environment to, for a while, it's going to mm. wane a little bit when you, when you get back in. Yeah. It's almost like a returning to the gym for the first time in a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. You've got, you've got to flex those social muscles and you've also got to get an idea of, of, which people in that environment are people that you want to talk to more or interact with more. Mm. I think also that there are the general things like you can't really control the the level of anxiety that you feel in situations. It's more mm. you, you've got a, a good feel for how anxious you, you may be for the first an hour or two of me going into a social environment. My anxiety is probably at its highest, but then after a while you start to feel a little bit more comfortable in the atmosphere. But then again, that, that's, an, that's another way of looking at it, you know, another way of adapting around things that you, you can't really control. Yeah. And also eye contact. Like, <laughs> you, can uh, work yeah. on, you can work on your <laughs> eye contact, but it's always going to be, mm. it's always going to be as uncomfortable. <laughs> mm. I think, you know, like with that progression, it's um, with eye contact, particularly with job interviews, uh, for my university interview, my body language was actually noted as one of my good points, and I was actually surprised at that. Mm. You've got very good body language. And I think the, the take-home message from uh, the progression with things like fake it till you make it, and if you don't use it, you lose it. It's more thick. It, these things will appear forced at the start, and you've just got to do them until they become second nature. Mm. 
because eye contact was something that I really, really tried focusing on. And after eight weeks of lockdown, where the only person that I had to look at was my own girlfriend, um, looking someone in the eyes is actually something that I've had to re- retrain myself since I've started my new job. Yeah, exposure, innit? Mm. It's getting getting used to um, the uncomfortabilities that come with uh, being autistic, I guess. It's, mm. And I think it's, it is always, there's a lot of sort of media-related things and things going around in the autistic community about this thing called masking which is basically as it's described as sort of putting on a personality for people, um, putting on mm-hmm. sort of a mask. To be honest, I think, of course, if, you, if you've been doing that all your life with people that you're close to, then mm-hmm. that's going to impact your mental health a lot because you're not going to feel like the person that your friends like is actually you. Yeah. I think you can, it's, it, you can always go back to your roots. like. The first time that I meet someone, yeah, I probably put on a lot of body language and facial expressions and um, use a lot of the things that I've learned. But after a while of getting to know them and and they've built a connection with me, then I start to sort of be more comfortable and and show them a bit more of my personality. I I think there's a line between using it as a life philosophy for every single situation ever and using it wisely for like things like job interviews and stuff. Yeah. Like, uh, please use responsibly. Uh, <laughs> Cause, cause ma- ma- masking is definitely not something exclusive to autistics. I mean, uh, uh, the, the aspect of um, putting on a front, mm. that is something that you see <laughs> throughout society. I mean, especially with, um, with my bartending job, I was bartending in Selfridges in the Trafford center in the mm-hmm. middle of handbag central. And the number, like the people that I was working around were like handbag salesmen for Louis Vuitton, um, menswear salesmen for, um, all saints, stuff like that. These people's jobs is putting on a mask and trying to sell people high end merchandise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to like a first date in the, like in the dating community, I've never seen a first date where someone was like a hundred percent honest on the first date. No, you know, there's, there's levels of intimacy and I think just mm. as conversation gets more intimate, not in that way, of course, but <laughs> 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 then things change, you know, I, I thought that, you know, a lot like you at some point, one point that telling people that I was autistic and showing people my oddities would be something that they wouldn't want to deal with or something that they they think was repulsive about me. Mm. But, you know, as you get older, as you start to enter the world of adults, you'll find, of course, you'll find assholes. Like, (laughs) they're everywhere. But you'll also find people that you can connect with. And the right people will stick by you despite you know, the sort of differences that you may exhibit. And it's, you know, to be honest, I think it adds to people's charm as well. Like, mm. the world can be a boring place. Having a bit of difference is, is keen, is good, but brilliant. I think I've got through pretty much all of the questions that I wanted to get through, yep. which is very good. Would you like to give us three main points or three main things that you want people to take away from the podcast? Yeah, I think um, first one would definitely be, um, as you and I are examples of, um, being autistic is absolutely no limitation on what you can do in this world. It does not prevent you from doing anything that you put your mind to. Number two would be, um, obviously, with what we've talked about with, say, going to social gatherings, making friends, um, my my second takeaway would be always remember to enjoy yourself because if that's not there, then you'll, you'll just be making, so say if you make friends and you don't enjoy hanging around any of them, um, you've essentially just wasted your time and effort. <laughs> so always remember to enjoy yourself. And let's see, take home point number three is probably with the, with the advice that we've generally uh, covered is, uh, when it comes to making friends, uh, focus on what you enjoy about hanging out together and then form the friendship from there. Brilliant. 
Thank you very much for those. And we've Thank got you. a last little question for you, which is a very sure. open question, and you can answer in any way that you wish. What does autism mean to you, Adam? What does autism mean to me? Um, autism to me uh, represents a challenge that I faced in my younger years. It's something that I was born with um, and something that I've uh, spent a lot of effort trying to uh, get past. And so autism for me represents the ability to do anything that I set my mind to because, you know, by all intents and purposes, I was born autistic. I shouldn't be as social as I am. And the fact that I made that progression, it means that I overcame that challenge. Yes. I think that your, your response to that is, is very, very different to a, a lot of people's response to that. And yeah. <laughs> what, was, think- what were the other responses? <laughs> A lot of it's about sort of being different and, and and all that kind of stuff. But I suppose you've you've taken more of the angle of pulling up the deficits of it, which I think it it is important to highlight that it does make things difficult. Like mm. I think that there, in my, in my view, there are a lot of positives to it. I think mm. there are a lot of good things about being autistic. The high IQ really is nice. <laughs> it's, it's average or above average so it's slightly slightly increased but i think it does make us more analytical and logical which i think is always a benefit yeah <laughs> with these mindless people around um these days <laughs> it's it's helpful if it's within the parameters that we're comfortable with mm, definitely definitely cool very good we've finished all of the questions um would you like to give out any links that you want to share or any social stuff? Like, completely up to you. You don't have to if you don't want to. <laughs> uh, to be honest, I, I'm not a very social media guy. Uh, I have Facebook because I have to. Um, and to be honest, being a bartender with, that, with no Instagram account, uh, it's probably hurt my career more than anything. <laughs> um, but um, I do not have any links to give out. Um, my only thing to say to the public that listens to this is um, stay home, wash your hands, social isolate, uh, social distance, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do exactly the opposite of what we've been telling you this whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. For like, the time um, being. <laughs> for the time being, take none of our advice and stay home away from everyone. <laughs> and that's coming from someone who is, is working on the front lines to improve the lives of people around the world in this, um, not around the world in the UK, um, in this crisis. And thank you very much, Adam, for providing us with these testing kits. And I think what you're doing is really great. Doing the Lord's work that doesn't exist. (laughs) (laughs) If anybody has any questions for you or they want to, they want to ask you anything, would I be all right in sort of contacting me and I can sort of send you them over? Would that be good? Uh, yeah, sure. You can uh, you can hand out my email address if you want. Well, well, you can hand out your email address if you want, or I can um, sort of hand out mine and then send you them if you don't want to give it out publicly. Oh, yeah, good point. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, contacting you first would be a good idea. <laughs> yes, cool. You can contact me at aspergisgrowth at gmail.com um, you can send any messages that you have for Adam over there any questions and if you want to be on the 40 po- 40 40 podcast <laughs> if you want to be on the 40 40 podcast you can always contact me on either my email or my social medias they're all at aspergisgrowth and very easy to find so if you've got any questions if you want to be on the podcast just send me a message over and I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible you can Find other parts of my work on various different sites, of course, the social medias, but um, primarily the YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth, which I make videos on autism and mental health. Pretty much more of a concise and and one-way version of this podcast, I guess. I think there's a lot of interesting videos on building social skills that would be um, very useful 
um, if you're trying to sort of build up your social skills and stuff, because I know it can be quite difficult. So yeah, go over there if you want to check it out. And of course, big thing that we're coming here to sort of rep and stuff, the documentary, Asperger's in Society. You can view it on YouTube or you can visit the webpage. I believe it's aspergersinsociety.com. Very easy to find. So I would be much appreciated if you came on, had a little watch, watched Adam's interviews, of course. Thank you very much for coming on to the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Have you enjoyed your... It's been a pleasure. You've, you've enjoyed it. I'm, I'm very glad. <laughs> yes, but it's honestly, like it's been a podcast recording, but it's actually been quite a nice catch up. Of course, yeah. It's always nice to have a little bit of social communication in these dark times. <laughs> uh, another, another little link in there <laughs> stay safe everybody as I said as Adam said actually wash your hands keep socially distancing don't go out and do any crazy stupid stuff and infect more people even if you think you're alright here's, here's a definite parting word if you're wearing a mask put it over your nose <laughs> have a good day and I'll see you in the next episode of the 40 Audi Podcast See you later. Bye. Wow. You're the first person to actually say bye after I said bye. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> no, no one decided they wanted to. Everyone was like, I'll just fade into the background. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is, I don't know when to stop. I don't know when to stop these recordings. <laughs> Let's stop it now. See you later, guys. Bye. <laughs>